Okay, can everyone hear me? Great. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk, Speaking in Different Tongues. Um, it's, first of all, it's a bit strange to be in front of a crowd again. It's been about two years since I've had the pleasure of doing this, so I'm a bit awkwardly nervous today. Um, I hope you enjoy uh, DevOps as it is um, today, because it's, it seems to be a lot of fun. Um, but let's, let's get into it, and let's start with introducing myself, because I'm going to be talking to you about, for about 40 to 50 minutes, so I think some personal introduction needs to be in order. Um, my name is Michael Demay. I'm a Belgian. I flew all the way in yesterday evening uh, to be here today. Um, I'm a research manager at iText. Um, iText is a company and a product that I've worked on and for for about 10 years now. And I'm the research manager there. That means that my team is in charge of innovation and standardization. On a day-to-day -day basis, we do prototyping. Um, we write proof of concepts on new technologies, new products that, that might benefit uh, the, the company or might leverage some new and existing technologies. Next to that, we do also do standardization. PDF is an ISO standard, meaning that it is being developed by an international group of experts, of which uh, me and my colleagues are a part of. So, um, there's about two of us, three of us in Belgium who are experts on this. Um, next to that, I'm a bass player. I love playing music. Um, that is my, my best bass that I've put on there for the picture. Um, I like to play classical music and tango. Um, if, if you want to talk music after the talk, please uh, hit me up. Uh, I should be on the floor somewhere. Um, and my next full-time job is uh, being a dad of two awesome kids. They're quite a handful. Um, I'm happy to be here as well so I can re recharge my batteries for at least a few days before heading back into the thunderstorm and tornado that they are. Um, that is my Twitter handle down there. I don't tweet often. Uh, you can follow me. Uh, you can ask me questions through DMs. I, I do reply to the to DMs. But my tweets are more of a random mess uh, of, of a man rambling random things. So um, feel free to follow me and to add me. Next to that, I need to do a small introduction of the company and the product I work for. It's not a commercial pitch, don't worry. It's just a positioning of, of the stories, where the story starts, basically. So iText, to me, is two things. It's First of all, it's my employer. I give them code, they give me money, so that I can buy food and shelter. So that's a very symbiotic relationship that's been going on for quite a while now. Um, and next to that, iText is a product. Uh, some of you might have already used it. It's uh, an open source PDF library, SDK which allows you to create PDF files through code or manipulate them, analyze them. Um, the sky is the limit here. You can do whatever you want with PDF files, and iText allows you to do that. Um, the more important part on this slide is that it's available in Java and .NET. Um, this is something that we're proud of that we're, that we're doing, and we offer the same functionality in Java and .NET. And the talk today is about how we do that and um, how we achieve that. Um, Throughout the 20 years of iText, a lot of things have changed. Um, let me just turn on my pointer. There we go. So there are, this is a timeline that we put together last year when iText existed for 20 years, the product, not the company. Um, and there's a few events on there that are quite uh, interesting. I'm going to highlight two. Um, for iText 5, which, happened, uh, which was released in 2009, just before I joined the company, um, we switched licenses to a more uh, commercially viable license. So we had an MPL slash LGPL license uh, thing going on. We switched that to, the, to a AGPL, which is a GPL-based license, which allows us to be a bit more uh, commercially viable. Uh, we have a dual commercial uh, license thing going on where you can either buy a commercial license or use a GPL-based based license. And that works out great for us because we're still around after 20 years. Um, the next important step that we've taken in the past few years is releasing iText 7. That was a big rewrite, a big refactoring of, of our code base, uh, which allows us to, to, first of all, to have a more maintainable code base. Um, it's easier to maintain um, some stuff that we were carrying around since the early 2000s. Um, and it also allowed us to release a lot of uh, plugins. We call these add-ons, and most of these are also open source, like our core library. Um, and some are, a minority is closed source for commercial reasons. Um, they allow you to cool, 
do the cool stuff like HTML to PDF conversion, which is a very popular, very uh, mainstream use case. Um, but also PDF sweep, which is an interesting use case, which allows you to redact PDF files. It allows you to remove or scrub uh, sensitive data from PDF files. Like if you're in the healthcare industry um, and you need to send out files to, um, to analyze the data in, the, in those files, you might want to remove patient data before doing that. And PDF sweep allows you to do that. Um, but the, the more important thing on this slide is that everything you see on the slide is available in both Java and .NET, but it, all, it hasn't always been like that. Initially in 2000, when Bruno Loewagy, the original founder, wrote the code, he only published it in Java. Um, back in the time, I think it was even Java 2. Um, it wasn't until 2004 or 2005, uh, my dates are a bit sketchy on this, that somebody from the open source community, uh, Paolo Soares, he, um, he published a port of iText known as iText Sharp back then. It was a complete uh, manual porting of the code from Java to C Sharp. So Paolo spent most of his free time, as, as most people do, working on open source projects to, to port that manually. Um, so we've been maintaining that code base since the mid 2000s. Um, so as of today, we still maintain those two code bases, a bit more updated. We're not on Java 2 anymore. We're a bit more modern, we're on seven or eight. <laughs> so we could be a bit more modern, but yeah, you have to follow your users to some point. And .NET, we've also seen an upgrade from two to um, four point something, and then .NET standard, or whatever confusing name the Microsoft is using uh, today. Um, but the, the importance of, of those two code bases is that they are functionally equivalent, meaning that whatever you can do in Java, you can do it in .NET, and even using the same code um, given some minor syntactical changes that you need to do because the conventions in Java aren't the conventions of .NET, more specifically C Sharp. Uh, for example, um, just method names, they, they are start with capital letters in .NET, while typically they wouldn't in Java. Um, so the small changes between the two of them. Um, they, they are functionally equivalent for most of the cases. That There are some edge cases where we don't um, offer equivalence because the, the functionality isn't available in .NET, for example. In, in iText 5, we've used um, PDF Graphics 2D, which is an implementation of Graphics 2D, where um, you can just uh, write um, drawing operations like draw a rectangle, draw a line, um, and that would translate to Swing or AWT instructions. Um, and we've put an implementation behind that interface to allow you to convert that to PDF syntax. Um, and .NET, as far as I know, doesn't have that, uh, that, that possibility, so we couldn't support it. But for all intents and purposes, they are functionally equivalent. So um, the story today is, is how we grew from this um, organically grown um, open source project uh, that was only offered in Java, and then all of a sudden got a .NET repo um, as well, um, into what we are doing today, which is a, a almost fully automated conversion between the two. It's not going to be a, a fully technical talk because I'm not the person in charge of it. So I'm just going to bring more of uh, an experiences and lessons learned because I was around for most of this. I joined the company in 2011, and today I am the, the employee that's longest in service. And I've had to do most of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm going to share my pain uh, and my tears. So starting at the, the old times, um, we, when I joined the company, um, I came straight out of college. I, I didn't have any work experience beyond my internship. Um, and I was taught, as probably most of you are, um, that you should have a build server, you should have automated tests, you should have uh, test-driven development, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When I arrived at iText, uh, <laughs> the, the reality was far from, from that situation. We didn't have a real build system at the time. Um, nothing was fully automated. Um, if we wanted to do a release, we, we had to run the Java uh, compile, uh, compiler on our own machines. We had to run the MS build for Microsoft on our own machines. Um, that was very, very archaic. Um, there was no real test suite. We had no automation and tests. Um, back in the time, Bruno had, Bruno Loewagy, the founder, he had um, written two books on how to use iText. Um, and those, of course, because you are documenting how to use a an SDK, a library, they contained a lot of code samples. And when I joined, the code samples were used as tests 
you would run them and typically you would get a, a PDF file as an output because we are a PDF library, obviously. And what you would do is you would compare the output against the previous version's output. Um, and that would happen on a visual level because PDF files are visual, obviously, but also on a structural level um, because a PDF file, while remaining the same visual layout, may, may look completely different behind the scenes. Different constructs may be used, uh, different syntax may be used, or uh, might not even, for instance, if that was a PDF file, might not, might not even be text, might just be random drawing operations or an image. Um, so you needed to do a lot of manual checks. So in essence, they, they were only regression tests. We didn't have unit tests at the time. Um, but more importantly, we had no real structured translation from Java to C-sharp. Um, what happened is that we had um, a person just doing manual uh, conversion of the commits, going commit by commit, um, which is a horrible, horrible thing to do. And I'm, I'm glad to say that today we don't do that anymore because uh, sometimes I would still wake up in the middle of the night in sweat, um, thinking that I had to be the one who drew the short uh, stick, or the short end of the stick, and do the C sharp conversion. So I've outlined a small graph on, on what what the progress what the process was at the time. So um, we would write, test, and build the Java code as you would do. So you get a ticket assigned to yourself. Um, you, you write a bug fix or whatever you test it. You build it. You make sure that it does what it needs to do. Um, and then the pro process would repeat until we would, would decide that we would need a release. Um, then at release time, Bruno would um, call a code freeze, basically. So I'm talking 2011. Um, and nobody was to commit anymore to the Java repo. He would build it. He would test the repo with the manual files that we talked about earlier. And then he would build the release uh, binaries um, and sign them. Also attached to that, the, um, the Java docs, et cetera, et cetera, all the marketing and uh, promotional materials that you need. Um, so that was a very manual, very uh, labor-intensive process that took Bruno about, at most, two weeks. It took him less, but let's, let's assume two weeks with all the um, bells and whistles attached to it. Um, which was crazy, right? Um, this is not something that you, you, you would do. But missing on the slide is .NET, or the C-sharp code, and this is because it was a separate process. As soon as the Java release was done, um, we assigned somebody, somebody in the, in the company. There weren't a lot of developers at the time, about four. Um, so the chances were pretty high that you were chosen as the .NET guy, and, or girl. Um, and what would happen is that that person would go over every commit and then per commit, make a new commit in .NET and port all the changes. Uh, then he would test it, build it, whatever you do. Um, this, this approach was chosen because we, we didn't want to roll up all the commits in one commit, just in case um, you, you made a mistake somewhere or um, if you have a bug in commit number 10 or something, you need to be able to pinpoint the exact uh, exact location of the bug. So that would take some time, and then we would go to, to release, build binaries, sign them, et cetera, et cetera. And th this would take about a month. Um, this, this took so long because you're rolling up these Java commits, which we've collected and assembled for about three months or so, and you're trying to convert them all. And this took a, a long time. First of all, you're, you're just copying code, you're translating it, but you also want to understand the context. Uh, you want to make sure that what you're writing, what you're converting is still correct. And that also takes some time. Um, and sometimes uh, a bug would show up in .NET. Uh, so you found something in the logic that went wrong, something um, from a previous version even that showed up as, as an error in .NET. And then the fun starts all over again. So you, you have to fix it in .NET because you stumble upon it. Um, or you log it for a future uh, release. But if the bug was as critical as could be, um, you would need to go back to the Java uh, build, see whether or not that code is still, uh, still contains that, that fix, or the bug in Java, and then fix it. Um, so after that month of the .NET release, you would sometimes, and this didn't happen too often, luckily. It happened like once or twice. Well, um, when, when I came on board, um, you would have to go back to the Java build. 
Um, you have to update the code, test it, build it, et cetera, et cetera, and then release a new patched version. So that, that means that you lose a lot of, a lot of time. Like if, if we would decide next week to release September 1st, that would mean on September 15th, we would have our iText Java build ready to go. Then a month later, October 15th, um, the .NET build would be ready. And then possibly a week or two later, uh, we would have a Halloween uh, special patch build. <laughs> um, so um, it worked. We, we, before I joined the company, that was the, the approach that um, before there even wasn't a company, that was the approach that uh, the group, the, the community took. Um, but it's very slow, as, as you can imagine. Um, it's also very error prone. You can have a lot of errors there. Uh, we are still human, and humans make errors, as you know. Um, but more importantly, and this is more from a commercial point of view, um, .NET felt like a second class citizen. Um, at the time, when I joined, uh, the .NET share of our, of our uh, revenue wasn't that big, but um, it's increasing every year. So um, I think putting .NET on the same level as Java um, helped us increase um, the, the revenue share of, of .NET. So um, we, 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 we did what we could at the time, and we came up with a new approach. Um, we decided to change things up, but first on a procedural level. Um, we didn't have anyone hired. We were a very small startup at the time, about five to 10 people. So we didn't have a, a built automation engineer uh, at that point. So what we did is we, we kept the, the, the flow pretty much as is, but we moved the .NET part up in our workflow. So the developer in charge of fixing a bug would write a Java code, test it, build it. He would then immediately also when the Java code is fixed, he would write the .NET code immediately. Fresh, um, with the bug in mind, he could fix it easier. Um, if he finds any mistake in .NET, he could backport it immediately to Java, um, and then test that and build it, and, uh, et cetera. So now, um, that whole process, the time was, was reduced back uh, because after the Java release, you don't have to spend another three or two weeks just to convert uh, the, the commits manually because they are already converted. And you can build both resource sets at the same time. So you can build your binaries for Java and .NET at the same time. Even though we're still doing it manually, we saved a lot of time here. And this reduced the time back to uh, about two weeks at most. Um, so as soon as we decide to release, we, we have about two weeks to get ready. Which is, which is amazing. It's, it's not as amazing as it should be, but at the time it was great because we were a lot more predictable, which we weren't at um, in the early days. Um, so um, the code was still fresh in the mind of the developer, um, so he could fix it immediately. Um, the code reviews also went smoother. Um, I mean, if I go back to code that I wrote last week, I'm, I'm already confused. Imagine going back three months uh, in PDF code nonetheless. Um, and you don't have to wait as long for the .NET builds anymore, which was also pretty great for a commercial marketing uh, kind of aspect to it. Um, I tried to think of a downside to it, and aside from there's less features per release, I couldn't think of anything. Um, meaning that if, if you have three months of, of uh, working in this workflow uh, compared to this workflow, you're going to finish up less tasks in those three months. Um, oh, sorry. But yeah, overall, it, it, you, you gain a lot of time. So if, if, you, if you would average that out over a release of a f five releases over a year, for instance, then you would gain a lot of time and you would see the time gains that you've had. Um, Mid-2013, I want to say, 14, we uh, hired a QA engineer slash build automation guy. Um, that was, was great. Um, and he, he, inst he like, instated a lot of things that we needed to do. He had experience with Jenkins, uh, which we didn't have at the time. Um, Jenkins, for those of you who don't know, is a build automation server. Um, and it's basically what it says, right? It, it automates your builds. It, you can script it. Um, you can tell it to build Java, and it will run Maven or Gradle or Ant or whatever you, you, you use in your project. Um, at the time, we were also using Team City because we, um, we, um, 
I'm just going by memory, but I don't know if we couldn't set up a, a Windows agent uh, on Jenkins or the knowledge wasn't there. But um, Team City had a lot of native support to, to, to run uh, the Windows agents. Uh, as of today, we, we run everything on Jenkins, no worries. Um, so th that produced a lot of advantages to us. Um, the, the main advantage that, that there is is everything is, is ran on a central server. Uh, the tests are automated now. Um, we have unit tests. Over the time, like every time I was adding functionality to iText, I would add a, f a few unit tests. I would add functional tests. Um, the regression tests were still there, um, but we were increasing our test suite. We were also using uh, JUnit and Unit uh, on both platforms, so automation was pretty great. Um, and the cool thing was that they were running on a central uh, station, so um, they were very deterministic. You, you couldn't blame it on your machine anymore if the tests were failing. Um, we also saved a lot of time on building. You didn't need to baby your build anymore. Uh, you can just click run, and it runs it automatically. Um, and more importantly, we, we had a, a script pipeline for uh, releasing. Um, there was a, a button that you could click, run, on the release pipeline, and it would do all the release steps that were uh, outlined in the release scenario that we used to have. So all the steps that Bruno manually did were now outlined in a script file, um, and everything was released properly. The binaries were put in, in um, our artifactory, and the uh, binaries were signed, and everything was, everything was great. Um, so 2014 was a pretty great year for, for our build uh, system. Um, but we still lose time on translating Java to C-sharp. Um, it's not a lot of time, it's not as much as it used to be. Um, like if, if, if you were to fix something in Java, let's say um, there's a color conversion going wrong, you're interpreting the, um, the hex code differently than you should, and instead of red you get pink. Um, that, that would take you, let's, let's say, a day to fix or something like that. In Java, with all the testing and, and everything going on, then you would the next day you would come back and that would take you um, a, a day or a half a day, a few hours to, to convert that to C-sharp. But that's still a few hours that you're doing double work, basically. And that's something that we were honing in on on the next few years. So in 2016, we um, one of our teams, and I do say teams because we did increase in size a lot during that time, um, one of our teams introduced Sharpen. Sharpen is an open source tool. It's a library, it's a CLI that you can use to automate Java to C-sharp code conversion. Uh, you can find it on GitHub um, to use, um, and it should run pretty, pretty easily out of the box. So you give it a project in Java and it spews out a C-sharp code. Um, but for some cases, it doesn't work uh, on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis you need to conf configure uh, quite some stuff if you want to have some proper C-sharp uh, being outputted. Um, so some of the things, um, need, you need to tell it how to handle some, some things in Java. For instance, um, something that I can think of immediately is, is reflection, or at least when I was still working on ITX Core, that was something that came up a few times. Um, Something else that we do differently in Java than in C Sharp is um, anything to do with crypto and encryption signatures. In Java, there's the, the, the security um, provider system where you basically just uh, inject your own security dependency. In most cases, we advise you to use Bouncy Castle, which is also a very mature, very reliable open source uh, dependency. But .NET doesn't have that framework available, so we, we ship with Bouncy Castle. Uh, already included and we have no uh, like abstract layer in between it that was the Java interface. So we, we did need to tell Sharpen how to handle certain cases. Um, also, on a tactical level, you might want to write certain constructs differently. You might have different uh, standards for, for um, how to write Java, C Sharp in your company or whatever. Um, so th that, that was some stuff that we needed to configure. And not everything was equivalent, and by that I mean we still needed to make some changes. Um, we, we have the concept of manual files, which is basically just a big list of things that Sharpen cannot um, translate for you. What you do is um, Sharpen will halt, and it will ask you, okay, I cannot translate this, please provide me with a translation. 
and then you give it um, an updated file, an updated uh, C sharp file, and then it continues on to do whatever it needs to do. Um, so there is still some minor manual work that, that needed to be done, but I would say given out of 100 commits, that would be like one commit instead of uh, all 100. Um, so we, we had Sharpen, we had that set up for our big release in 2016, iText 7, um, and we introduced that on our Jenkins uh, pipelines as well. So we introduced uh, an autoport pipeline, I'm not sure if it's legible from that far away, I didn't assume it would be that far. <laughs> Um, and the autoport pipeline basically has three big steps. Um, it builds Java, so it checks out, it pulls the um, Java repo, it builds it, tests it. And if it's green, it goes to the next step, which is the autoporting. Um, it basically runs um, Sharpen. What we do is we let it check itself out first from the repo, then it builds itself to make sure it's got the latest version, because we do need to keep track of changes in, in uh, Sharpen, so we build Sharpen regularly. Um, just to make sure that we got all the, the new configurations ready. Once that's, that is built and tested, we run Sharpen on the Java repo and out comes a .NET repo, completely uh, translated for you. Um, so in this step, it would also halt and ask you for the manual files if you have some. Um, and then once the, the build.NET is ready, it would push that to the repo. Um, and th that is the magic that is known as uh, autoport within our company. So um, the, the results of this is we had automation, which is good. Um, nobody wanted to spend too much time on, on writing the same code twice as you shouldn't. And there is um, less room for manual errors. Um, like the manual files is still where you can have some f uh, mistakes. But it wasn't as it used to be back in, in the day when the single person, single guy or girl, would um, write C sharp code. Um, sometimes a commit was skipped. Maybe um, the, the person had PTO in the middle of, of uh, the month and he couldn't continue, or he, he just made a mistake or something, or a typo or whatever. So there's less room for manual errors, and there's clear expectations. This, this build takes about half an hour at most, an hour maybe, because it's, it, it builds everything and it tests it and, uh, and whatnot. So that's pretty great, um, but mistakes were still made. Uh, sometimes our, our builds were still read because of um, being too hasty in your manual files. Um, and, and that's... Um, about when we hired another QA engineer who was more proficient in this, um, more experienced with that, with uh, this whole thing. And he set up a um, merge pipeline. So on, on Jenkins and on Git, we introduced um, a merge pipeline. On, on the Git level, we work with um, Gitflow, which some of you might know. So basically, Gitflow has two uh, big branches that you work on. You have your main branch, which holds all your versions. So you tag your version one, two, three, uh, and the develop branches, your working copy, your draft, basically, um, where all your working changes are being pushed and merged into. Um, and then upon release, so your, your um, main branch is the blue and your develop is the pink here, but uh, the purple, I think, here. Um, and then once you're um, ready for release, you split off a, um, a release branch, which I think is blue or green, and then it would merge into, um, into the main branch. And that's, that's um, something that um, you can configure um, uh, in, in uh, Jenkins upon your uh, release pipelines that you have. Um, but the, that QA engineer, that built automation engineer, um, also um, introduced one of the, the, the biggest uh, things that we uh, implemented, and that was that we didn't allow direct changes to develop anymore. Develop was going to be as strict as, as our main branch was going to be, and the only, the only thing or the only user or the only uh, application that could push to develop was um, Jenkins or somebody who, who um, stole all the permissions from Jenkins. Um, but yeah, no, um, what happens is that um, we have a merge pipeline and that pipeline, um, you give it a branch, the branch that you worked on, your feature branch, and then that is going to build, compile, uh, run the tests. 
Um, and then it checks a few things, like the sonar cube quality gates needs to be uh, passed. So sonar cube does some static code analysis for us. So you can also configure it to, to do other stuff, but that's one of them. Um, so once that, that passes, if all your tests pass, um, and once they, the builds are green as well, um, and autoport was successful, so that's a, the biggest um, thing in there, um, then we can merge both Java and .NET into develop, and then that is going to be ready for um, release down the line once we decide, or once the quarterly release comes up that we have now. So we, we went from basically having um, to do everything manually um, by having somebody draw the short straw to having everything done on, on Jenkins. We have close to no red builds anymore because of porting mistakes, um, because you cannot make any porting mistakes anymore, or close to none. Um, so um, there, I'm not sure if that is legible, but that I wanted to give you a brief overview of, of the timeline. I'm just going to highlight a few important things on there. Um, so right here, there it says that the releases were manual and that .NET took an extra month. That was 2009, right before I joined. Um, I would like to say that all this changed because of solely me, but that, that's not true. It's a, it's a group effort. Um, in 2012, um, we have automated tests. Um, everything runs uh, semi-automatically using Maven and uh, the MS build tools. Uh, a few years later, we um, have built automation people on board. They instate some release procedures. We have uh, Team City and Jenkins also on the on the board. Um, and then. A few years later, when we released 7.0.0, we also have Autoport, which is uh, a separate repo that we maintain as well internally. Um, and now we have the merge pipeline of functional tests. But I wanted to highlight that this is a very slow, very um, incremental process over the years. Um, and we, we are very happy that, to be where we are today. Um, there's a lot of things that are on the future um, roadmap. Um, Zooming in a bit, there's um, being able to test um, different versions being combined of, of plugins with different. Uh, so you might use plugin A version two with iText seven one. Um, does that version of the plugin still work with the previous version of iText or not? This is information that we already have, but we don't have that automated, and we would like to do that. Um, we would like to pull in the pull requests into the system. We still are an open source company. Our GitHub um, is modestly uh, active. We do have some, some pull requests coming in uh, every now and, and then. Um, so we would like to pull that into that whole um, workflow. Um, and aside from that, there's also some cool stuff on the list, mainly things that I wrote, some prototypes. Uh, but we can talk about that after the, um, after the talk. Um, and that, that is about it. Um, I, I, I had. I rushed a bit here and there because I was a bit awkwardly nervous. Again, it's, it's the first time in two years. Um, but thank you for your attention. Um, if you want, you can ask questions now, or we can talk uh, on the exhibition floor. Um, and with that, thank you. Yes. Uh, all the tests, so the question is um, whether or not the, the unit tests are the same on the .NET side, or? Uh, we, we used to have them as well before, and they are now also ported, I think. So um, we, we did try to port as much as we could, and um, being an open source company, um, you, you want to provide your customers with the same thing that you have internally as well. So. Um, it would be a shame if you didn't have the .NET tests available as well, because you're testing the same thing, but some things might be different in the .NET build because of the slight discrepancies that you have between the two. So yeah, we do have them both available. Um, we should have them both available. <laughs> uh, you can check it on our GitHub page, by the way, if you want to. Yes? Yeah, 
So the question was, um, when writing Java, do you need to take into account uh, how Sharpen will deal with the Java code to make sure that it uh, converts correctly? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, for some things, you do need to take that into account. Um, it's been a while since I've written on the iText core library itself, uh, about a year or two now. Um, but we, we do have a, a page on our internal knowledge base on, on to get new developers up to speed, like avoid this construct, but use it differently. Um, so yeah, we, we do have to um, take care of that. I think one of the first things that comes to mind is maybe lambdas in uh, Java 8 that might have to be written differently or, um, yeah, but I can't give you a conclusive answer besides yes, we do need to take that into account. <laughs> Yes? Um, I can't answer that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can check it for you and we, I can answer you after the, 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 the thing. But I would imagine that um, you would have to have some specific .NET profiles to check. Um, because sometimes .NET works differently. Um, but I would assume that most things are already caught in the Java pass through SonarQ, but maybe. Yeah. I would assume that we do have some .NET profiles, yes. Yeah, would be the best thing to do. <laughs> yes? So, so the question is. Um, so the question is a um, bit of a throwback to the, the previous question. Like, if you uh, have to change your uh, the way you write Java, does that impact performance? That's your question, right? Um, I don't have that data available, but I think the changes that we had to make was very limited. Um, I, I, can, I can check whether or not the, the, what kind of changes we need, and then I could give you a more conclusive answer, but I think it's very minimal uh, what you need to, uh, need to write. There, there are going to be some, possibly some performance sets, obviously, but uh, I think they're of a minimal nature. <laughs> mm, well, I only know ReSharper, but that's <laughs> something else. <laughs> no, uh, I'm not aware of any, anything else uh, like that. Um, so the question was, are you aware of anything that converts C-sharp to, to Java? Um, and I'm not aware of that uh, at the moment. Maybe, uh, isn't there a C-sharp implementation on the JVM that you could use? I know that there is a Java implementation that, that you can use on uh, the uh, CRL um, or CLR, but uh, I'm not, I don't know, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> it's not something that, we are primarily a Java develop, development company, so we focus on Java development, so that question hasn't popped up yet. <laughs> but it would be interesting to chain them together, like sharpen, unsharpen, and then sharpen again. Like some, what's it called? Russian Google Translate or something? Google, Google Translate party, it's called. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you for, for your questions and for, um, for uh, being here today. Enjoy DevOps.